the future of freedom, a liberal democracy at home and abroad, written by Fareed Zachariah, narrated by Cameron Payne. Chapter 1, A Brief History of Human Liberty. It all started when Constantine decided to move. In AD 324, the leader of the greatest empire in the world went east, shifting his capital from Rome to Byzantium, the old Greek colony, at the mouth of the Black Sea, which he promptly renamed Constantinople. Why abandon Rome, the storied seat of the empire? Constantine explained that he did it on command of God. You can't really argue with that kind of logic now, can we? Though vanity and ambition surely played some part as well. Constantine desperately wanted to leave behind a grand legacy and, short of winning a war, what better way to do so than build a new capital city? The move was also politically smart. Constantinople was closer to the great cultural and economic centres of the day, such as Athens, Thessalonica, and Antioch. Rome in those days was considered the backwater, and Constantinople was a more strategic point from which to defend the empire against its empire enemies, mainly Germanic tribes and Persian armies. In the 4th century, the pivots of history lay in the east. Emperors don't travel light, and Constantine was no exception. He shifted not just the capital, but tens of thousands of its inhabitants, and com commandeered immense quantities of food and wine from Egypt, Asia Minor, and Syria to feed his people. He sent his minions across the empire to bring art for the new Rome. Such was the pillage that the historian of Jacob Burkhardt, Burkhardt had described it as the most disgraceful and extensive thefts of art in all history, committed for the purpose of decorating Constantinople. Senators and other nobles were given every inducement to move. Exact replicas of their homes were waiting for them in the new city. But although he took most of his court, Constantine left one person behind, the Bishop of Rome. This historic separation between church and state was to have fateful and beneficial consequences for humankind. Although the Bishop of Rome had nominal seniority, because the first holder of that office, Peter, was the senior apostle of Christ. Christianity had survived by becoming a decentralized religion, compromising a collection of self-governing churches. Rome was now distant from the imperial capital. Other important priests, such as the Bishop of Byzantium, of Byz Byz yeah, Byzantium, and those of nearby An Anitoch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria, now lived in the shadow of the emperor and quickly became appendages of state authority. Far from palace power and intrigue, the Roman church flourished, asserting an independence that eventually allowed it to claim the mantle of spiritual leadership of the Christian peoples. As a result of this separation, the great English classicist, classical scholar Ernest Barker observed the East Byzantium fell under the control of the state, and the West, Rome, came under the sovereignty of religion. It would be more accurate to say that in the West sovereignty was contested. For 1,500 years after Constantine's move, European history was marked by continual strife between church and state. From the sparks of those struggles came the first fires of human liberty. So, section. Liberty, old and new. Obviously it is an oversimplification to pick a single event to mark the beginnings of a complex historical phenomenon. In, the case, in this case, the development of human liberty 
The stories have to start somewhere. The rise of the Christian church is, in my view, the first important source of liberty in the West, and hence the world. It highlights the central theme of this chapter, which is that liberty came to the West centuries before democracy. Liberty led to democracy, but not the other way round. It also highlights a paradox that that runs through these accounts. Whatever the deeper structural causes, liberty in the West was born of a series of power struggles. Consequences of these struggles between church and state, law and king, Protestant and Catholic, business and the state, embedded themselves in the fabric of Western life, producing greater and greater pressures for individual liberty, particularly in England but, and by extension in the United States. Some might contest this emphasis on the Christian church, pointing fondly to ancient Greek, Greece as the seabed of liberty. They all think Pericles, famously funeral ori famous funeral oration, delivered in 431 BC, which conjured a stirring vision of, Ath of the Athens of his day dedicated to freedom, democracy and equality. For much of the 19th century, British and German universities curricula assumed that the greatest flag of human achievement took place in the city-states of Greece around the 5th century BC. The study of ancient Greece and Rome and Oxford and Cambridge is still colloquially called the Greats. But the Victorian obsession with Greece was part fantasy. Ancient Greece was an extraordinary culture, fertile philosophy, science, and literature. It was the birthplace of democracy and some of its associated ideas, but these were practiced only in a few small city-states for at most a hundred years and died with the Macedonian conquest of Athens in 338 BC. Over a millennia later, Greece's experiment became an inspiration for democrat, Democrats, but in the intervening centuries it left no tangible in or institutional influences on politics in Europe. More to the point, Greece was not the birthplace of liberty as we understand it today. Liberty in the modern world is first and foremost the freedom of the individual from arbitrary authority, which has meant for most of history, from the brutes, power of the state. It implies certain basic human rights, freedom of expansion, of association and of worship, and rights of due process. But ancient liberty, as the Enlightenment philosopher Benjamin Constant explained, meant something different. That everyone, actually every male citizen, had the right to participate in government, governance of the community. Usually all citizens served in the legislature. If this was impractical, legislatures were chosen by lottery, as were American Jews today. The people's assemblies of ancient Greece had unlimited powers, and individuals' rights were neither sacred, inferior, nor protected in fact. Greek democracy often meant, in Constance's phase, the, subject, the subjection of the individual, the authority of the community. If we accept, then, Constance's phase, does that mean that China is not communist, but democratic? Recall that in the 4th century BC in Athens, where Greece democracy is said to have found its truest expression, the popular assembly by democratic vote, put to death the greatest philosopher of the age because of his teachings. The execution of Socrates was democratic, not liberal. The Greek roots of Western liberty are often overstated. The Roman ones are neglected. When Herodotus wrote that the Greeks were a free people. He meant that they were not slaves under foreign conquest or domi domination. 
an idea we would day today call national independence or self-determination. By this definition, North Korean today are free people. Now, now, I think, is it possible that it could be the South Koreans who are free people? Depends on who you view as the rightful ruler of Korea. The Romans emphasized a different aspect of freedom, that all citizens were to be treated equally under the law. This conception of freedom is much closer to the modern Western one. The Latin word for it is libertas, is the root of ours. Whereas Greece gave the world philosophy, literature, poetry and art, Rome gave us the beginnings of limited government and the rule of law. The Roman Republic, with its divided government, free branches, election of officials to limited terms, an emphasis on equality under law has been a model for governments ever since. Most consciously the founding of the American Republic. To this day Roman political concepts and terms endure throughout the Western world. Senate, Republic, Constitution, Prefecture, Western law is to be is so filled with Roman legacies until the earliest 20th century, lawyers had to be well versed in Latin. Most of the world's laws of contract, property, liability, defamation, inheritance, the state and the rules of procedure and evidence are variations on Roman themes. For Hermit, a squiff, the gifted amateur classicist who became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Rome's greatest gift to the ages was that she founded, developed and systematized the jurisprudence of the world, the, a gaping hole in Roman law. However, it was that practical matter, it didn't apply to the ruling class, particularly as the Republic de degenerated into a monarchy by the first century. Emperors such as Nero, Vitellius and Galba routinely sentenced people to death without trial. Privileged private homes and temples sorry, pillaged private homes and temples and raped and murdered their subjects. Caligua Caligula famously had his horse appointed senator an act that probably violated the implicit, if not explicit, rules that once August body had. Traditions of law that had been built carefully during Rome's Republic years crumbled in the decadence of empire. The lesson of Rome's fall is that for the rule of law to endure, you need more than good intentions for the rulers. For they may change with the intentions and the ruler. You need institutions within society whose strength is independence of the state. The West found such countervailing force the Catholic Church. The paradox of Catholicism. Rose was concrete legacy has been the Roman Catholic Church, which the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes called the growth of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. The culture of Rome became the culture of Catholicism. Through the church were transmitted countless traditions and ideas. And of course, Latin, which gave educated people all over Europe a common language, and thus strengthened their sense of being a single community. To this day, the idea and structure of the Catholic Church, its universalism, its hierarchy, its codes and laws, bear a strong resemblance to those of the Roman Empire. The Catholic Church might seem an odd place to begin the story of liberty, as institutionism has not stood for freedom, for thought, or even until recently, diversity of belief. In fact, during the Middle Ages, it grew powerful, 
became increasingly intolerant and oppressive, emphasizing dogma and unquestioning obedience, and using rather nasty means to quash dissent. Let us recall the Spanish Inquisition. To this day, the structure remains hierarchical and autocratic. The church never saw itself as furthering individual liberty, but from the start it tenaciously opposed powers of state and thus placed placed limits on monarch rule. Monarch's rule. It controlled crucial social institutions such as marriage and birth and death rights. Church properties and priests were not subject to taxation. Hardly a small matter, since at its height the church owned one third of the land in Europe. The Catholic Church was the first major institution in history that was independent of temporal authority and willing to challenge it. By doing this, it cracked the edifice of sick power and in nooks and crannies individual liberty began to grow. The struggles between the church and state began just over 50 years after Constantine's move. One of Constantine's successors, the Emperor Theodosius, Fido while in a nasty dispute with the Thessalonians, a Greek tribe, invited the whole tribe to Milan and orchestrated a blood-curdling massacre of his guests men, women and children. The Archbishop of Milan, a pious priest named Ambrose, was appalled and publicly refused to give the Emperor con Holy Communion. Theodosius protested, resorting to a biblical defence. He was guilty of homicide, he explained, but wasn't one of the Bible's heroic kings, David, guilty not just of homicide but of adultery as well? The Archbishop was unwieldy. Thundering back in, Eng in the English historian Edward Gibbon's famous account, You have imitated David in his crime. Imitate then his repentance. To the utter amazement of all, for the next eight months, the Emperor, the most powerful man in the world, periodically dressed like a beggar as David had in the biblical tale, and stood outside the church at Milan to ask forgiveness for the Archbishop. As the Roman Empire crumbled in the East, the Bishop of Rome's authority and independence grew. He became the first among the princes of the church called, called Il Papa, the Holy Father. In 800 AD, Pope Leo III was forced to crown the Frankish ruler Charlemagne as Roman Emperor. But in doing so, Leo began the tradition of investiture, whereby the church had to bless a new king and thus give legitimacy to his reign. By the 12th century, the Pope's power had grown and he had become a pivotal player in Europe's complex political games. The papacy, the power, legitimacy, money, even armies. It won another great symbolic battle against Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV, who in 1077 challenged unsuccessfully Pope Gregory VII's expansion of the power of investiture. Having lost the struggle, Henry, so the legend goes, was forced to stand barefoot in the snow of Canossa and seek forgiveness from the Holy Father. Whether or not the tale is true, by the 12th century the Pope had clearly become, in power and pomp, a match for any of Europe's kings. And the Vatican had come to rival the grandest courts on the continent. Subsection the geography of freedom. The church gained power in the West for, in the sim for a simple reason. After the decline of the Roman Emperor, 
it never again faced a single emperor of Europe. They said the Catholic Church was able to play one European prince against another, becoming the vital swing vote in the power struggles of the day. Had one monarch emerged across the continent, he could have crushed the Church's independence, turning it into a handmaiden of state power. That is what happened to the Greek Orthodox Church, later the Russian Orthodox Church, and for that matter, to most religions around the world. But no ruler ever conquered all of Europe, or even the greatest part of it. Over the millennia, only a few tried. Charlemagne, Charles V, France, Berlin, also France, Kaiser Wilhelm, Germany, and Hitler of Germany. All was thwarted, most fairly quickly. What explains this? Probably mountains and rivers. Europe is riven with barriers that divide the, its highlands into rivers, valleys, bordered by mountain ranges. Its rivers flow into sheltered, navigatable bays along the long, Ident indented Mediterranean coastal, all of which means that smaller regions could subsist, indeed thrive, on their own. Hence Europe's long history of many independent century countries. They are hard to conquer, easy to cultivate. Their rivers and seas provide ready trade routes. Asia, by contrast, is full of vast flatlands. The steeps in Russia, the plains in China, through which armies could march unhindered. Not surprisingly, these areas were ruled for millennia by centralized empires. Europe's topography made possible the rise of communities of varying sizes. City-states, duchesses, republics, nations and empires. In 1500, Europe had within it mo more than 500 states, many no larger than a city. This variety had two wondrous effects. First, it allowed for diversity. People, ideas, art, even technology that were unwelcome or unnoticed in one area would often thrive in another. Second, diversity fueled constant competition between states, producing innovation and efficiency in political organizations, military technology and economic policy. Successful practices, copied, losing ways were cast aside. Yet spectacular economic and political success, what the economic historian Eric Jones has teamed, termed the European miracle, might well be the result of odd geography. A footnote here, Africa is particularly unlucky in its geography. Despite being the second biggest continent of the world, it has the shortest coastline, much of which is too shallow to, to develop ports. Cities historically had little trade. Its rivers are not navigatable because they are either too shallow or were deep, scarred by rapids of waterfalls. Dramatic scenery makes for disastrous comments in this case. Commerce in this case. Add to this impractical heat sorry, add to this tropical heat and accompanying disease and one has a sad structure for explanation for Africa's underdevelopment. Subsection, Lord and Kings. Geography and history combine, combine to help shape Europe's political structure. The crumbling of the Roman Empire, the backwardness of the German tribes that destroyed it resulted in decentralized authority across the continent. No ruler had the administrative capacity to rule a far-flung kingdom compromising so many independent tribes. By contrast in their heyday, 
Ming and Manchu China, Mughal India, and the Ottoman Empire controlled vast lands on diverse people. But in Europe, local landlords and chieftains governed their territories and developed close ties with their tenants. This became the distinctive feature of European feudalism, that its great landowning classes were independent. From the Middle Ages until the 17th century, European sovereigns were distant creatures who ruled their kingdoms mostly in name. The King of France, for example, was considered only a Duke of in Brittany, but had limited authority in the regions for hundreds of years. In practice, if monarchs wanted to do anything, start a war, build a fort, they had to borrow and bargain for money and troops from local chieftains who became earls, viscounts, and dukes in the process. Thus Europe's landed elite became an aristocracy with power, money, and legitimacy. A far cry from the groveling dependent courtier nobles in other parts of the world. This near equal relationship between lords and kings deeply influenced the course of liberty. As Guido di Ruggiero, the great historian of liberalism, wrote, without the, eff without the effective resistance of particular privileged classes, the monarchy would have created nothing but a people of slaves. In fact, Monarchs did, did just that in much of the rest of the world. In Europe, on the other hand, as the Middle Ages progressed, the aristocracy demanded that kings guarantee them certain rights that even the crown could not violate. They also established representative bodies, parliaments, states generals, diets, to give permanent voice to their claims. In these medieval bargains lie the foundation of what we today call the rule of law. Building on Roman tradition, these rights were secured and strengthened by the power of the nobility. Like the clash between church and state, the conflict between the aristocracy and the monarchy is the second great power struggle of European history that helped provide again the unintentional, unintentionally the raw materials of freedom. The English aristocracy was the most independent in Europe. Lords lived on their estates, governing and protecting their tenants. In return, they extracted taxes which kept them both powerful and rich. It was in one scholar's phrase, a working aristocracy. It maintained its position not through elaborate courtly rituals, but by taking part in politics and government at all levels. England's kings, who consolidated their power earlier than did, the, did most of their counterparts on the continent, recognized that their rule depended on co-opting the aristocracy or at least some part of it. When monarchs pushed their luck they triggered a baronial backlash. Henry II, crowned king in 1154, extended his rule across the country, sending judges to distant places to enforce royal decrees. He sought to unify the country and create a common imperial law. To do this, he had to strip the medieval aristocracy of its powers and special privileges. He planned, his plan worked, but only up to a point. Soon the nobility rose up in arms. Literally, and after 40 years of conflict, Henry's son, King John, was forced to sign a truce in 1215 in a field near Windsor Castle. The document Magna Carta was regarded at the time as a charter of baronial privilege. 
detailing the rights of feudal laws. It also had provisions guaranteeing the freedom of the church and local aristocracy for towns. Local auto, autocracy, autocracy for towns. It came out in vague terms against the oppression of any of the king's subjects. Over time the document was interpreted more broadly by English judges, turning it into a quasi-constitution that enshrined certain individual rights. And even in its day, Magna Carta was significant. In the first written limitation on royal authority in Europe, as such the historian Paul Johnson noted, it is justly classified as the first of the English statutes of the realm. Footnote, collection of English laws that make up its unwritten constitution. Realms, from which English and thus American liberties can be said to flow. Subsection, Rome versus the form. After church versus state and king versus lord, this great power struggle between Catholics and Protestants was to prove the longest and bloodiest. And once again it had accidental revolutionary implications for freedom. Its improbable instigator was a devout German monk who lived in a small backwater town called Wittenberg. It was the early 16th century Across Europe, there was already great dissatisfaction with the papacy, which had become extraordinarily powerful and corrupt. Rome, through scandalous and scandalous practice, was the widespread sale of indulgences, papal certificates absolving the buyer of sins, even those not yet committed. The money financed the church's never-ending extravagance which even by the glittering standards of the Baroque era was stunning. The newest project was the largest, grandest cathedral ever known to man, St. Peter's in Rome. Even today when one walks through the acres of marble in the Vatican, gazing at the gilt, the jewels, the tapestries and the frescoes, from wall to wall and floor to ceiling, it is easy to imagine the pious rage of Martin Luther. There had been calls for reform before Luther. Erasmus, for one, had urged a simpler, stripped-down form of pure worship. But none had frontally challenged the authority of the church. Luther did so in 95. Tightly reasoned thesis which he famously nailed to the door of the ca castle church in Wittenberg on the morning of October 31st, 1517. Luther may have had right on his side, but he also had luck. His heresy came at the op opportune moment in history of technology. By the time the Catholic Church was reacted and responded to his action, strictly forbidding the dis dissemination of his ideas, the new printing presses had already circulated Luther's document all over Europe. The Reformation had begun. 150 bloody years later, almost half of Europe was Protestant. Where Martin Luther to see Protestantism today with its easy-going doctrines tolerate much and require little, he will probably be horrified. Luther was not a liberal. On the contrary, he had accused the Vatican of being too lax in its approach to religion. In many ways, he was what we call today a fundamentalist demanding a more literal interpretation of the Bible. Luther's criticism of papacy were quite similar 
to the free made today by Islamic fundamentalists about the corrupt, extravagant regimes of the Middle East that have veered from the true, devout path. Luther was attacking the Pope from the conservative end of the theological spectrum. In fact, some have said that the clash between Catholicism and Protestantism and Protestantism illustrates the old maxim that religious freedom is the product of two equally fanatious fan fanaticisms, each cancelling the other out. Most of the sects sprang up as a consequence of Reformation were even more Puritan, Puritanical than Lutheranism. The most influential of them was a particularly dour creed, Calvin, Calvinism, which pointed the wretched depravity of man and poor chances of salvation for all but a few, already chosen by God. But the various Protestant sects converged in rejecting the authority of the papacy and, by implication, all religious hierarchy. They were part of a common struggle against authority and, although they didn't know it at the time, part of the broader story of liberty. For all their squabbles, the small Protestant sects in Northern Europe opened up the possibility of a personal path to truth. Unmediated by priests to the extent that they imagined any clergy at all. It was to be elected by a self-governing congression. Often minority sects within a larger community, they fought for the right of all minorities to believe and worship as they choose. Together they footnote. Visitors to the city of Geneva, which has long seen itself as the spiritual birthplace of Protestantism, find in its grandest public park a memorial to the Reformation. Built in 1909, the vast wall with sculptures and ban reliefs, bas reliefs, celebrating the legacy of the Reformation, turn us all once feuding fathers of the movement, such as Luther, John Calvin, and even Oliver Cromwell, and American Puritans that many of these sects opposed one another is forgotten, as perhaps it should be. Back to the book. Open, together they opened up the space for religious freedom in the Western world. They helped shape modern ideas about not only freedom of conscience and of speech, also critical scientific inquiry, first of religious texts such as the Bible, then of all received wisdom. Science, after all, is a constant process of challenging authority on a contesting dogma. In that sense, modern science owes an unusual debt to 17th century religious zealots. The more immediate political effect of Protestantism was to give kings and princes an excuse to wrest power away from increasingly arrogant Vatican. Some think they were looking to do anyway. The first major assault took place not in support of Protestant ideals, but for the less exalted reason that a restless monarch wanted an heir. Henry VIII of England asked 
Pope Clement the Seventh to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon because she had not produced an heir to the throne. Not for lack of effort, uh, in eight years she had given birth to one daughter and five infants who had died and had miscarried twice. The Pope refused to give King Henry broke with the Vatican, proclaiming himself head of the Church of England. Henry had to doctrinal dispute with the Catholic Church. In fact, he had defended the Pope against Luther in an essay for which the Vatican honoured him as defender of the faith. The title of his successor is strangely bare to this day. The newly independent Anglican Church was, thus, Catholic in doctrine, except for the small matter of the Pope. The English break was the first and most prominent of a series of religious revolts and wars against the Vatican involving virtually every state in Europe and lasting almost 150 years after Luther's act of defiance. The wars resulting from Reformation came to an end in 1648. The Peace of Westphalia, as it was called, ended the Thirty Years' War among the Germans and rendered onto Caesar that which was Caesar's, plus a good bit of that which used to be God's in actually the Pope's, it revised a, it revived a 1555 idea. Surius Rigo Erios Religio whomever's domain his religion prevails. That princes could choose their state religion and it implicitly permitted religious toleration. and migration. The year 1648 is not a clean point of separation between church and state, but it does symbolize an important shift in Western history. Westphalia laid to rest the idea that Europe was one great Christian community. Christendom, governed spiritually by the Catholic Church and temporarily by the Holy Roman Emperor, the future belonged to the state, the enlightened state. By the 18th century, the real challenge to princely power came not from religion, but from local authorities, the princes, dukes, barons and counts. Over the course of this century, the prince would best his rivals. He strengthened his court and created a central government, a state that had dwarfed its local rivals. The state triumphed for several reasons. Technology shift, shifts, heightened military competition, the stirrings of nationalism, and the ability to centralize tax collection. One consequence, however, is worth noting. The strengthening of the state was not good for liberty. The power of monarchs grew. They shut down most of the medieval parliaments, states, assemblies and diets. When Francis' estates general were summoned in the spring of 1789 on the eve of the revolution, it was their first assembly in 175 years. The newly powerful royals also began abolishing the multi-layered system of aristocratic privileges and regional traditions and guild protections in favour of a uniform legal code administered by the monarch. The important exception was the English Parliament, which actually gained the upper hand in its struggle with the monarchy after the glorious revolution of 1688. On the face of its weakening of the aristocracy, face 
of the aristocracy might seem a victory for equality under law, and it presented as such at the time. As the Enlightenment idea swept though through 17th century footnote, the idea of a whole wide community of believers still exists in Islam. The Ummah. There is, however, no Muslim equivalent of the Catholic Church or the Pope. In chapter 4, they had the Sultan one, so didn't they? Europe's philosophers, such as Voltaire and Diderot, fantasized about the rationalization and modernization of government. But in the practice, these trends meant more power for the central government and the ex evisceration of local and regional authority. Enlightened, absolu enlightened absolutism, as it was later called, has some progressive elements about it. Rulers such as Friedrich II of Prussia, Catherine II of Russia, and Joseph II of Austria tolerated religious dissent enacted legal reforms and lavished money and attention on artists, musicians and writers might have explained the good press they received but the shift in power weakened the only groups in society capable of checking royal authority in excess. Liberty now depended on the largesse of the ruler. When under pressure from above or at home, even the most benign monarch and his not so benign successors abandoned liberalization and squashed dissent. By the end of the 18th century, with war, revolution, and domestic rebellion disturbing the tranquility of.